you so much, my good friend. You do uh, prove that too many cooks do not spoil the broth. Very happy to follow after you. It's a little bit funny because I was looking at the screen and I realized it's not perfectly synchronized. And I decided I would check, is it before us or behind us? Until I realized it cannot be before us because we're actually here in reality speaking. <laughs> but it took me like five seconds to realize that. So you know, it reminds us that we need to be grounded in reality. Reality still exists, however much we talk about the virtual world. Now, uh, what I thought I'd do is a quick follow-up to Jim's very important uh, reminders, because it's so easy to talk about training as the Band-Aid, or even the solution. You know, just add a little bit more training, and we'll solve all the problems. So I have on purpose called my four-minute presentation military education, because there is a difference between education and training. And we are moving towards the military with more and more AI-enabled systems, even if we say that we won't use them as autonomous systems. And we simply have to think through how we educate ourselves and our soldiers as we do this. So my remarks are based on the Warring with Machines project and a parallel project that Greg and I have had the pleasure of doing with some of our colleagues for the Defense Ministry in Norway. Uh, their task was to uh, find out what are the lacunae, what are the things that we are missing now in the Norwegian defense establishment when it comes to using AI-enabled systems. And one of the things they asked us to do uh, was to find out how can we improve uh, uh, education. So uh, I'll summarize quickly some of the things I've heard. They're from Norwegian ethics instructors, but I think they are recognizable others. The first really has nothing to do with AI per se, but as you you know, add new requirements to what must be included, almost every ethics instructor will say that we have a challenge of time to actually do this. And not least the fact that in practice it's often not prioritized. If you're one day late from a maneuver because it took too much time to complete it, and there was an ethics instruction module the next day, it's like, yeah, we can move that. It's not really that important. No one is saying that explicitly, but that is the experience of many ethics instructors at many levels. Secondly, coordination. Are the different relevant uh, military actors and levels well enough coordinated? And I mean many things by that, and I cannot go into detail, but I'll give you one example. As we move into a territory where we'll have what I'll in a moment call the force mix, uh, you know, the closest collaborators say to a pilot, we'll actually be a machine. How do we construct cases and examples that can be used in our education that are realistic? Do we learn enough from the specialists? And that's one of the main conclusions, that we have great specialists, many of them being educated by Kirsi here, up at Lillehammer in Norway. But do we have enough contact between them and those who are doing, say, the initial instruction to soldiers or for the cadets at the military academies, giving them good cases and examples that we can work with that are actually updated in order to make both training and education more relevant. Then I think the question can be turned around to the specialists, and now we also move into the uh, private sector. Um, does everyone, including the technology specialists, have the requisite understanding of the basic precepts of the laws and ethics of war? Once again, not a new question. Just think of all the debates we've had through the years about private military contractors. We put them in charge of a huge military prison. Do they know what the rules of the Geneva Conventions are? This is after one of the conclusions after the Abu Ghraib scandal almost, or now, 20 years ago. It's good to hear from Kongsberg, and we've had the pleasure of working with you on the ethics that sort of is in the walls already. Well, in many walls, it's not installed whatsoever. And finally, if I may use the language that we have tried to use in our uh, project, namely the old and tried uh, language of virtues, uh, we often talk about certain moral virtues being especially important in the military setting. Car courage, obviously. Um, moderation. The both moral and intel intellectual virtue of prudence. In what ways do they change? Or does their contents change? In a military where the main collaborators will in many cases be pre-programmed machines. So what are our aims here? Well, our aims are Firstly, educate critical and competent users of these. I mean, that's why we're doing this. And if training doesn't succeed in that, we're not doing it rightly. Secondly, 
this is something that has been briefly mentioned. I think it's something we could have spent a lot of time on, namely the whole concept of de-skilling. We all know that from worried observers of modern traffic. We no longer have stick shifts. Most things are done via a computer. Soon we will be driving it all. Will we really know how to drive? I think what has happened in several naval forces around the world, including Norway, that we now put them back on a sailing ship. A sailing ship for a few weeks to learn the very basic analog workings because it's so easy to lose that sense of what we are doing physically when so many things are actually delegated elsewhere. Can the same happen in the field of morality? Well, at least the question has to be asked. This is related to what we know as a black box and bias problems, you know, that you take for granted that, well, I'm not sure I should be choosing that target, but the machine told me to, and I should probably trust it. And I think everyone in this room can realize there can be deep problems with that. And then finally, as I already indicated, we must hope that this is a time of increase rather than decrease consciousness and knowledge about the ethics and law of armed conflict. We need, as several people have said here, increased consciousness about the basic precepts of international law. And the danger is that we are moving into a modern technology reality where this is not emphasized enough. Well, my good friend Jim started with Stanley Kubrick, so I'll end with him too. This is almost trite to those who are here, but I think it's good nonetheless. We all know HAL 9000 from Arthur C. Clarke's story, filmed by Stanley Kubrick in 1968. You know why it's HAL? You know, it's just moving one letter ahead in the alphabet from IBM. <laughs> That's HAL 9000. Here we have him. And of course, the thing you think when you watch that movie and the um, flight to Jupiter is that these people aboard should have been educated differently in the way in which this machine works, because it ended up being smarter than them, much smarter than them. When they tried to hide from HAL 9000, it could read their lips and realize it was about to be turned off and therefore started fighting. And uh, we hope that proper education and consciousness about what is actually happening from the private level up is what can at least answer some of Kubrick's challenges. Thank you.